Okay. There are some operations, some events in history, which honestly should be made into a movie. There are some which would be a very serious movie. There are others which, frankly, would make the most febrile and scariest horror movie ever created by Hollywood run away screaming in agony. And that'd be mental agony. Or maybe anguish would be better description. But there are other operations. There are other operations for which the only motif one can look forward to in the cinema, the only motif, is the Carry On series. And welcome to what I am christening for this video and this recording only, Carry On Invading Britain. This is one of those operations and one of those events in history which is actually quite disturbing to dis discuss because at every point and every turn you sit there going, but it couldn't get worse. They can't make it worse. Why would they make it worse? Why would they make it worse? Oh, good lord, they found a way to make it worse. And they do. They do. I mean, there have been many hubristic uh, planning attempts of how to invade Britain. I mean, there was Napoleon's idea of potentially getting his invasion army across the channel by balloon. That's an interesting thing in 1800s. Balloon. Uh, to use those to get on, especially when you realize his idea was to construct massive fires on one side that would heat up the air and then the balloon would drift across without any source of heat and get across the channel and then deposit the troops on the other side. Just, no, that's not going to work. And thankfully that was only short term and then he was talking about barges and other things, but we'll leave that to one side. We'll leave that all to one side. There is, of course, Operation Sea Lion. Or as I personally christen, uh, personally christen it, death ride of whatever remained of the German Navy. Uh, the Kriegsmarine surface fleet would have been, that it was in, would be involved in Operation Sea Lion would have been wiped out. And so would any troops who'd been put to sea. There are some who then would turn around and go, well, you know, they owned the, uh, the, the Luftwaffe, owned the daylight sky. They do. They don't own the night line, the nighttime sky. And the trouble is, the Royal Navy does own the night. It's a very scary organization at night in, when it comes to fighting at night. But no, even Operation Sea Lion, and for all its hubristic, even Napoleon's plans of invading Britain, actually are probably. And I shudder to say this more thought through and more well thought out than the invasion plans which lead to the Battle of Fishguard. Do you have any idea how it hurts me to say that? I mean, this plan is actually worse than Operation Sea Lion. And that is an atrocious plan. There is a reason why everyone who wants to simulate it and its effects of Britain's hand waves the actual naval invasion part of it. Because the actual part of it of actually getting across the channel, landing and organizing and supplying that landing forces, is we have to get past it or hand wave in super weapons or some magical thing for it to happen. Well, this... This is worse. This is worse. Shameless book plug. There is a link down below to a competition where there are winning a couple of copies of these. Thank you to everyone who supports the channel. Without you, this channel would not be where it is. Just thank you. Thank you, people who like, share, subscribe, want to hear this content. Thank you to everyone who's patrons and suggest these topics. Although you didn't suggest the Battle of Fishguard, and I presume that's because many of you, the patrons, didn't know about it until I told them. And although that may have started now a whole new thing of them trying to find random small battles from history which are distressing. To read about and go how did this happen in case of fish guard i'm fairly certain the reason it's completely wiped from history is because it's a very bluffing british victory when it is entirely bluff almost but it wins and the british are almost embarrassed at how they win it and the french are embarrassed they actually did it and so everyone tries to forget it other than the pub the pub 
at Fishguard remembers. And that's a good pub. The War of First Coalition is... Oh, good lord. This is, this is one of those wars where you really are hoping for anyone to have a modicum of strategic sense. And the fact is, the couple of the people involved who do really stick out and stand out as almost geniuses. There's William Pitt. Pretty much, he stands out. He really does. There are a few others who do quite well. King Frederick of Prussia. He does well. And... There's a couple of others who are fairly decent, but France, well, they stumble from Louis the Sixteenth, technically being in charge, but he ends up dead, uh, to Jacques Pierre Brasseau, who is technically the deputy of the National Convention, and then to the president of the National Convention, who is uh, Maximilien Robespierre, and then of course. Uh, Napoleon Bonaparte and the President of the Directory, Paul Barras. Uh, there is just so much fun in the various leaderships of France on one side and everyone else on the other side. And some, uh, what happens is that they still don't always do well. I mean, sometimes you're looking at the sheer numbers and you're going, how can the coalition forces lose this one? They can find a way. They can find a way. Naval terms. This war is famous for the glorious 1st of June, which is glorious. It is glorious. It's a, it's a wonderful battle. Um, and the evacuation of Toulon. If you're wondering something about British history, okay... There are some commentators who like to pretend that Dunkirk is a standalone bit of history of the Royal Navy evacuating the British Army or doing an evacuation of places. No. Almost as long as the Royal Navy has been using Copenhagen as a verb to Copenhagen, they have been doing evacuations. This is why when you have Crete happening in World War II, Cunningham is referring to it as a tradition that the Royal Navy is always there when the army needs them to get them out. That tradition starts in this period. It actually started a little bit before it, but it's worthwhile remembering. So, these are some of the big things in this war from a naval perspective. And amphibious operations perspective, there's a few interesting things going on. Yes, the British are doing their usual, dancing around the world, taking... French colonies, whilst they basically hire, bribe, cajole, um, variations upon, upon manipulation, uh, everyone else to do the land fighting in Europe to keep the French busy in Europe. Um, occasionally, they, and the Royal Navy does its best jo uh, job to keep them as sealed up as possible as well. It works quite well as a sound strategy. This is the period where we're talking about, when we start talking about Prussia, and Britain, Germany and Britain being traditional allies, where Germany provided, or Prussia provided, the military power, and Britain provided the naval power. This is the period where we're talking about that developing. So this is the point at which the route we can say for World War One, when we start talking about naval race emerging in the 1880s, 1890s, and the naval laws and all those things coming on. This is why we can say Britain is kind of shocked, because it's long-term ally, not quite as long-term as Portugal, but there are a few alliances which have lasted as long as the one with Portugal. That's that's really a special alliance, very special alliance, mainly due to the British love of port, let's be honest. It, it, it does come stem from the British love of port. But that was a traditional alliance, and a traditional scenario, where the British provided the money, and the Navy, and Prussia or Germany provided the troops. It had worked. When it starts to break down, the British get very, very... What are we going to do with the world? When that traditional alliance breaks down, the British don't have official alliances, of course. They have the Anglo-Japanese alliance by that point. The British have never had peacetime alliances before. But the closest thing they've had to a peacetime alliance, well, then again, there is the agreement with Portugal, but we'll leave that to one side. That's special. 
a traditional alliance, or rather a tradition of alliance rather than an alliance, is with Prussia and Germany. And that all starts really in this period. It starts to really strengthen in this period. And there are many campaigns and actions in this war. And from them, a leader emerges for the French. Louis Lazare Hoche. Now, Hoche is actually a fairly decent general. And it hurts me to say that, because his absolute naval plan, his amphibious warfare plan for this operation is absolutely absurdly stupid. But, he has a plan. And it's it's always worrying when you have a French, a French general who has a plan for invading Britain. As a rule, it's not good. And before anyone again brings up William the Conqueror, he was Norman. Uh, that came from Norseman, which meant he was a Viking who'd settled in France and learned how to ride a horse. But they were still very much more Viking than they were, fr uh, than they were French. We're going to remember that, because he does actually understand things like logistics and maritime operations, which is one reason why he has an advantage against Harold Godwinson, who is not so good at them, but is a fairly good general. But no, for Lazare Hush, well, he has a plan. He also has status. He's won battles, he has risen up the ranks, he's done really well, and, you know, he dies of natural causes, which honestly is an absolute feat in the French Revolutionary period. If he'd actually lived any longer, I don't think he would have died of natural causes, because there were various political machinations going on to try and kill him, but they didn't succeed as quickly as... As well, the joy of natural causes. What can I say? Sometimes biology is a better assassinator than anything else. The plan, the plan is simple. Fifteen thousand troops under his personal command will land in Bantry Bay Island, where the United Irishmen were proposed to raise island support. They were promising sometimes forces as large as a hundred thousand Irishmen would flock to the flag. And diversionary attacks were landed in Newcastle and Wales. The Welsh plan was to uh, land in Wales and march on Bristol. And the plans for both were to use the 1st and 2nd Legion, as they were sometimes called at that time. And they were roughly 1,500 troops strong. So he was going to send 1,500 troops to land in uh, Newcastle. And he's going to send 1,500 to land in Wales. As the version attacks. Again, he fervently believed, fervently believed, that the people of Britain and the people of Ireland would all flock to the flag. They would all come to him to want to throw off the cruel yoke of Britain. When they actually landed in Wales, they thought the people coming to fight them were coming to join them at one point. As always, when you have plans like this together, they are based in a lot of wishful thinking. I, I sincerely doubt the United Irishman ever had 100,000 troops in this period. Of 100,000 people willing to become soldiers, anyone who, the vast majority of Irish people who were probably of fighting age were either employed in little farms all around the place, or um, quite a lot of them were recruited and fighting for the British. The British had a habit of raising Irish regiments and sending them off to fight other people because it kept them away from Ireland and stopped them fighting them. It's the classic British methodology of keeping the Irish. Um, Involved, let's say, was to hire them. There are Irish personnel in the fleet. There are Irish personnel all over. And there is an advantage to that. Because if you're asking someone to rise up in rebellion against Britain, that's an abstract concept and it's easy to rebel against. 
If you want them to rebel and kill their mate James, and their mate, their mate James, their mate Alan, their mate Ivan, or Ivor, probably, because if he's Welsh, that's Ivor, to mutiny and uh, in the ra when they're in the ranks, that's a bit more difficult because they're my friends. They won't come with me if I start fighting for if I want to start fighting for United. I'll have to kill them. I don't want to kill them because they're my mates. I hate the officers, maybe, or I maybe don't. Some of them I might like, some of them I might not. But the thing is, it's far more difficult to get people who are in a group to fight that group. Fight within that group, rather than fight something which is outside the group. And so if you do recruit them, they tend to not rebel as much. Or rather, you can sometimes use them to put down other rebellions. It, it's uh, not a subtle strategy, but it's an effective one. Anyway. Hosh had forgotten for a few things. Uh, one of them being the weather. Secondly being the weather. Thirdly being the weather. And the starting point is, and it, it must be considered this, his actual plan is pretty darn terrible. When I say terrible... I mean, you look at the time of year he's sending the fleets out. He wants them to actually land in December. In fact, his force actually reached the Irish coast on the 30th of December. He takes his formation of 15,000 troops, he takes 48 vessels... With the support of Vice Admiral Justin Bonaventure Mora de Gals. Again, not exactly the most famous commander of the French Navy, but an efficient officer. And one who has an intriguing career. Dies in 1809. Again, of natural causes. Always good. They had set sail for Ireland on the 15th of December. Again, this is not a good time. And they get there on the 30th of December. And you sit there and go, you're trying to invade the British Isles in December. In December. In the middle of winter. Because winter around here is November to February, really. Uh, there, is, there is an argument that the first, day of, uh, the first day of spring is the 21st of March. Um... I would say sometimes that's a li that's a, that's hoping it's going to be a coming a little sooner than it actually does, and there's an idea that the winter doesn't start till like the first of November, and I would again argue that winter started a while before then in the UK. So in December, that period of December, it's not good. The Irish Sea is not good. Uh, it's really not good. In fact, it's so bad that a British fleet actually managed to sail past the French fleet without realising they were there and they were just on their way home and they actually had more powerful ships than the French fleet had they sailed past in the bay went actually further into the bay were harboured up and then didn't realise the French were there and, until the French had left and of course they do return to France at which point Hosh goes on to all sorts of things. But don't worry, the diversionary attacks are already inbound. They're already on their way. Well, at least one of them is. One of them isn't. The, new, the one to Newcastle is already on its way. It gets halfway across. And frankly, they've got illness. They've got all sorts of issues going on. They basically just give up. They basically go, this is not going to work. This expedition to Ireland, this idea of raising a massive army in Ireland, going across to Britain... And marching down and liberating Britain isn't working. But don't worry. The voyage carries on. And the voyage to Newcastle stops. But they do send out the voyage to Wales. And this voyage is, ca is carrying with it the Legion Noir. Which are a product of the 1795 Battle of Quiberon. And the American Revolutionary War, because um, well, they have some very interesting American personnel who are mostly considered traitors by America because they've been recruited by France rather than America to fight the British. 
I'll be getting into one of those in a second. Um, they are Americans who hated the British. But they wanted they agreed to fight for the French to fight against the British to liberate America. But the Americans, even though when they allied with the French, didn't like anyone else. Uh, the Americans who were employed of the French, they didn't view them as it, it. It gets intriguing. It gets intriguing and multi-layered. And, um, well, Legion Noir is what's heading to Wales. And Legion Noir is made up of some people who were on prisoner detail, some people who are probably some very fine soldiers. They do have some very good soldiers in them. There are, the Grenadiers section are especially a good, good line infantry, good solid line infantry. A large number of soldiers are not very good. And it's basically a penal battalion to an extent. And... Basically, uh, they've armed them with a load of British equipment, which they have died, which is why they're called Legion Noir, because to try and get the red to be covered up, they've tried to dye it black. Most it's a muddy brown, but black Legion sounds a lot better than muddy brown Legion, doesn't it? it really does. Still, an interesting organization to send. An interesting organization to send, and it doesn't get any better. Now let's talk about the British leadership that's going to be involved, because this, this just takes the bit of skip, okay? We have Lord John Campbell, 1st Baron Cawdor, Captain of the Castle Martin Troop in the Pen Broke uh, Yeomanry Cavalry, and Member of Parliament for Nansha. I'm just going to leave it there, because he ends up in charge of the whole thing. Yes, he's a captain, but he's also an MP, he's trusted, and frankly, the rest are not considered exactly that smart. Lieutenant Colonel Thomas Knox, who is supposed to be in charge of the Fish Guard and Newport Volunteer Infantry, who probably would have stayed in command and been in command of the operation if he'd actually done something more than have a party, turn up late, and then decide he had to run away and take all his troops with him and abandon Fish Guard. I'm, I'm sure there were good reasons in his head, but he had a fairly strong defensive position. There were more forces on their way to him. All he had to do was hold position. He could probably have ended up in command. You have Captain Longcroft of the Royal Navy, who brings artillery along, helpfully. And you have Lieutenant Colonel Colby of the Pembrokeshire Militia, who basically turns up at various points with a lot of reinforcements, but doesn't actually end up in much of the fighting himself. And Lord, of the count, Lord Lieutenant of the County, Lord Milford, who basically decides that he is going to put Campbell in charge. Because Campbell he actually trusts. Campbell is a fairly good historian, antiquarian. Uh, he is, has an extensive personal museum. Uh, is an extensively a researcher type. Uh, he has good knowledge and he has some experience and he has been an MP for quite a while. He knows what he's doing. I will admit that when this particular battle does take place, he has moved from the House of Commons to the House of Lords. It happens. It's a good thing, and that's actually what he was done. He'd been an MP prior to that, and then he's made, created Baron Corder of Castle Martin uh, in June 1796, and he becomes a lord and a member of the House of Lords. And that's that's useful because he's still a parliamentarian. He's still intrinsically connected to the British state, and so he ends up in charge. There's a there's a whole discussion I'll be getting into when I'm talking through the battle, and I would like this to point this out. There is literally one small patch of sanity in the entire British command structure, and Campbell is close to it, but he isn't it. However, he is the closest thing to a safe pair of hands. They find themselves with at a certain point, so he ends up in charge. Because unlike other people, he's actually heading towards the enemy, and is taking troops with him. That's always an improvement over the other options. The French leadership. The French leadership is... Oh, the French leadership, frankly, makes the British leadership look amazing. Uh, they have William Tate. 
They also have a Commodore there called uh, Jean Joseph Casnier, but he basically drops the troops off and runs away. He... To be fair, that was pretty much his orders, and you have to agree with that. But I would also add that's kind of not good for morale because if any of you want to go and Google Fishguard and the area around Fishguard. A, the space where they drop them off is not exactly spectacular. And B, they could really do for some support. Those troops could really do some support. In fact, if he'd had, they'd had these ships in any of the French ships actually still there when the battle, quote-unquote, um, takes place, well, things could have been very different. Things could have been... Very, very different, because it takes place on the beach, and one of these ships would have been overwhelming firepower for the British to deal with, because they don't really have much in artillery. Although, by the time the battle takes place, the fort did actually have a resupply of ammunition, and they had got extra cannon bought with them by the Royal Navy, so things could have been not as bad as they would have been if they'd actually pushed and pressed it earlier. Because there is Fishguard Fort, and Fishguard Fort is a beautiful thing. Basically, the British government, because there have been other, including Americans, landing in Wales and other issues, had listened to the cries of the local populace and said, well, look, if, and this is a big if, if you really want this, if you really want this, we will supply the gunners, but you have to build the fort and pay for the fort. The gunners came from the Woolwich Arsenal. The fort was built locally. It is not much of a thing, but honestly, it's actually quite a defensible position. And without much effort, you can turn it into a position where a large force can be held off for quite a long time to try and get in there. The trouble is, they are supposed to have adequate supplies of powder and ball. And there's a dispute over who is supposed to secure the supplies of ball. I would say... There is a goodly argument that the person who was supposed to be responsible for seeing to it was the local militia commander, uh, one Lieutenant Colonel Knox. The reason I would say that he was supposed to be seeing to it was because of the arrangements. The government was supplying the powder, but the ball was supposed to be organised locally. And the local senior officer, the local militia commander, was Knox. And that was the arrangement which had been got. And then Knox's regiment, uh, Knox's regiment of militia had been stood up. He's in charge of it. So, whilst he, I'm sure he would have blamed his quartermaster or various other personnel for the not having shot for their cannon, um, myself, I'm sorry the buck stops with the person in charge. The French, I don't think, actually really tried the harbour. Mainly because their ships were under orders to take minimal losses and minimal damage. And you just don't want to run into that. Because it might not have many cannon. But if those cannon are firing, they could do damage. As it was, they were doing some powder charges. And firing basically blanks to make the French convinced they do actually have something. Um... That was probably enough for Castanier to go, no, no, we're not doing that. We're not doing that. And so they actually landed around the corner. They landed around the corner from Fishguard. They actually landed in Caraguastad uh, Point. And very quickly, thanks to the presence of militia, thanks to the presence of the Woolwich Gunners, the British officers around the area start hearing about this. Their reactions... Hmm, prove interesting, but they do hear about it. The British response was, of course, as you'd always expect, completely measured and organised. Oh no, it wasn't. It was absolutely not. Um, William Knox had raised the fish guard in Newport Volunteer Infantry in 1794 when the British government had called to arms. He'd immediately decided that to to command this regiment, he would appoint his 28-year-old son, Thomas Knox, uh, who had purchased his commission and had no combat experience, but that never really held up quite a few people in history. 
purchasing your commission. There are a fair number of examples of officers who have purchased their commissions and have actually proved quite proficient. Because, let's be honest, if you've studied history enough and the pace of warfare in this period, and compared to your most av uh, most commanders who are going to be fighting, especially if you find yourself in a what is going to be a defensive action, you really don't have to do that much creative. You just have to organize your troops and have proficiently supplied them. Unfortunately, that even that particularly low bar was not necessarily met. Now, they were helped by the fact that the French, when they landed, pretty much started to desert and started to try and loot the local settlements, which really put an even bigger, um, you know, spanner in the works go far, so far as getting a local rebellion going of people who believe in the, um, I don't know, liberty, fraternity, and all the other, whichever things they were particularly shouting out about that point in revolutionary France. It changes every now and again, and I stopped kind of trying to keep track of what the significant slogans were in each year a long time ago. It all basically means the same thing. Someone else has got to be in charge, and that's going to give me power. Because, honestly, most of revolutionary France is about who's going to have power, not about really changing things. You look at the systems they set up, it's about who gets to exercise the power, not about what the powers are and what the freedoms or liberty really is. And, well, Knox is theoretically there because he has the Fish Guard and Newport Volunteer Infantry. Which is, by that time, the largest unit in the county of Pembrokeshire. It has 300 troops in four companies. This is in large part because... William Knox, i.e. the father who paid for it, had put out quite a large bounty. He'd wanted to do this done, well, this done properly. The trouble is, whilst the father had wanted it done properly, the son wasn't necessarily up to the task, and one of the son's administrative duties included overseeing the supply, of course, of fish guards fort with suitable shot. And it was notably absent of shot. And whilst there were many attempts to blame the central British government for this, it was only their fault in so far as they didn't check that the locals were actually delivering on the system they promised. And they'd for some reason presumed, considering the locals had argued for this, had wanted the local support, and had invested so much in raising this militia unit in... Bit, bit of pie in paying for and building the fort and all these things, that they would actually also sustain their part of the bargain. I'm, I'm not sure where the money for shot went. I ha There are some all sorts of interesting ideas around that, but we'll leave that to one side. That was a long time ago. We'll leave it to one side. Now, on the 22nd of February, the night that they landed... There was a social event going on at a place called Tregent Mansion, and Thomas Knox, the lieutenant colonel, was in attendance, dancing a night away. And when a messenger arrives from Fishguard, from the infantry, and from the Woolwich Gunners, to inform the lieutenant colonel of the invasion, he carried on dancing. The phrase that's often used in various books is, that news was slow to dawn on Knox. No, he he was... Um, how do I put this? Not the sharpest bushel in any tree, although he certainly believes himself to be. And he really didn't understand what the French are invading means, it seems. He felt that was carry on drinking and having uh, dancing, and then deal. Uh, then hours later, after presumably someone more senior up the social ladder... It does seem to be like there were a couple in present, uh, present at the event. Had a, heard the news and had a quiet conversation with him. He suddenly remembered that he's the lieutenant colonel in charge of the militia. And he should go and start actually doing some work. So. He goes to Fishguard Fort. And while there, he does order the Newport Division, or rather company, 
uh, to march the seven miles to fish guard of all haste, to gather as many of his troops together in one place. 30 miles away from Fishguard is Lord Corder with his troop of Pembroke Yeomanry Cavalry. He is at Stackpole Court and he is the troop massed there in preparation for a funeral the following day. He didn't have them brought together for exercise or anything else. It was for a funeral. There were other troops there from various other units for the funeral. It was a big important funeral. And within, a, it said that the messenger had not finished retelling his message before Cordor was issuing orders and was gathering all the troops and issuing mild forms of blackmail and cajoling to get everyone under his command and start assembling them to march to Haverford West, where he felt that all the volunteers from other units would also be marching too, and so they could gather together and form up a larger force. He didn't know who was going to be in charge of it, but he knew he had to get to Haverford West, which is the big sort of county town on the road to, uh, to Fishguard, which has a castle and various other things. And if you get there, secure there, you can then form your force up and march north. And that's his plan. At Haverford West itself, there is Lieutenant Colonel Colby of the Pembrokeshire Militia, and he summoned together 250 of his soldiers. Another active officer, who is incredibly active, is uh, Captain Longcroft, who was technically supposed to be in charge of the press and the revenue vessels at Milford Haven. He decided when he heard this that, well, he had 150 sailors, as a couple some officers, Nine cannon, and um, he'd march up, and he li would leave six of the cannon at Haverford West Castle to provide for its defence and help for its security, and the rest of the cannon, all three remaining, and the remainder of his forces not needed to man those cannon at Haverford West, would march with the local forces. At Haverford West, there is Lord Milford. Lord Milford is... The, uh, the Lord Lieutenant of the county. He is a very powerful and influential person in the county. And he takes one look at all the officers in charge. All the potential officers. And all the unit commanders have a discussion. And Lord Corder is delegated with full authority and overall command. And basically... You take the forces north, you take command, and you do your job. You, What happened in this discussion is often considered to be long and interesting. But basically it seems to have gone along the lines of, you bought your commission, you bought your commission, you have no experience or understanding at all. You have no experience or understanding at all. You're not sure what to do. You're not sure what to do. You actually are a lord, being an MP, have some vague experience, and have been doing this for a long, long time. You're in charge. I'm the captain of the castle main troop. You're a lord. You're in charge. We're going with feudal rules. It works. And it does work on this occasion. And of course, whilst the British are responding, the French are doing stuff. Or rather, when I say the French, I mean this hodgepodge force, the, the Legion, uh, Legion Noir. Um, mainly, you have two groups which are working together. There are the troops which stay loyal to Colonel Tate and are still actually acceding to his commands which are roughly 600 of the 1,500 troops he brought with him. So, yeah, he's um, he's found that 900 of his troops really would prefer to wander around Hamlet's village, villages and local churches, um, setting fire to things, using Bibles as Kindle, and basically trying to live off the land by forcing themselves into villages and Hamlet's, which is actually getting quite a lot of them killed and beaten up and captured. Quite often by Welsh women. 
But the other group of his troops who are doing pretty pretty well are those which are under the command of Lieutenant St. Ledger, who seems to have managed to keep especially the Grenadiers very loyal and very capable. And it's Lieutenant St. Ledger who basically uh, takes primary movement, primary capability. Now, Knox decides that he's going to attack on the 23rd of February. If long as he's not outnumbered. He sends this note to Colby. Good. This means Cordor's coming up to reinforce. And on the morning of the 23rd. Well. Knox looks out. He's got a short 100 troops yet. So he's only got roughly 200 there. And he decides he's facing. Because apparently information comes in. He's facing a force 10 times the size of his own. Now. The thing is, the way he writes it, he claims it was he felt it was ten times the size of his total force. So he felt that Tate had brought with him an army of three thousand troops rather than fifteen hundred. And as we know at this point, Tate actually has roughly six hundred troops loyal and actually obeying his orders. So yeah, th there are some issues going on here. But Knox decides that the best thing for him to do when he's heavily outnumbered is to abandon his defensive position. Because he's got three choices. Attack the French, defend Fishguard, or retreat towards re reinforcements from Howard West. He decides he's going to abandon his defensive position, which isn't the greatest defensive position, but let's be honest, he's not got that many troops to hold it. And he's got not got to hold it for that long, because it's not as if the French have actually attacked him. They are posturing around in the hills, away from Fishguard. So he's holding Fishguard at this point, with not much problem. He decides he's going to retreat to Halford West. And, well, this causes small trouble because he decides he gives orders to spike the cannon in Fishguard Fort. And the Wilch Gunners refuse to do that because they don't take orders from him. And because why do they need to spike the guns? There's no shot for the guns because he hasn't procured them. So, no one can do anything with the guns. No one can do anything with the guns. They've got powder for them. That's it. At 0900 hours, when the guns have not been spiked, Nox sets off towards his rear and basically has scouts reconnoitring the French. And he's got roughly 194 men with him when he meets Lord Cordor at 1330 hours at Treff Game. This is roughly eight miles south of Fishguard. At this point, there is a dispute over who's in charge. At which point, Knox might have been called, although we have no confirm confirmation of this, a lily delivered pup who has no knowledge of how to fight and has innards, which are various other things. There are all sorts of reports for what exactly is said there. Uh, it's one of those interesting battles in that the, um, the accounts of what is said get spread further and further and further and generally some actually get politer some get far more insulting depending on who's telling the story all we know is there was an argument over who was in command uh, there was also an argument over the fact that not only did Knox want to take command he wanted to withdraw the forces that Corder was bringing up and go to Howard West and wait for more response reinforcements which he felt he would then command because he was the local militia commander Cordor was probably attempted to introduce him to some steel or a fist at this point, but we, as again we have no account of this one. It seems to have been a civil, if not if not exactly polite, exchange. And Cordor assumes command, and the combined British forces return to Fishguard. <clears throat> at this point. Please note that despite the troops leaving Fishguard, only in the Fishguard being left in the protection of the Woolwich Gunners and its own residents, when they get there, the French haven't made any move to Fishguard because they haven't realised this has actually happened. Um, Tate is busily trying to organise discipline because his troops had found some Portuguese wine which had come from a Portuguese ship, which had wrecked on the coast a few weeks previously. Morale had collapsed, the convicts were in open rebellion, the off a meeting against their officers, well, they thought that's what they were, but it was a very big trouble because 
Most of the troops spoke French, or variations thereof. Remember, there is far more linguistic diversity in this period than there is today. And many of the officers didn't speak French, including Tate. Wonderful. In fact, uh, there are many, many things which Tate might have spoken, but it was definitely not French. And so there's an actual dispute as to whether some of the officers, or some of the commands are actually being translated properly. Oh, and some of the officers actually understood what their men were doing. And they would have disappearing men during, uh, during the night, during the day. They were all disappearing off. They would soon be rounded up by the British. Mostly because they managed to do things which were very silly in areas where there are lots of people with sharp instruments wandering around. By the 23rd, the only troops he really has that are loyal are his grenadiers and French regulars who've been transferred in Legion Noir. The 600 tr troops in the bulk, as I've already said. Um, there ha were at least six Welsh and French killed during clashes overnight. Uh, he had presumed the Welsh would welcome him. I keep do saying this, but I have to emphasize that Tate was really shocked by this. He was, in some accounts, emotionally traumatized by the fact that the Welsh did not greet him with over open arms. And that uh, especially the women did not appreciate his arrival. They, they, he, he felt he'd be treated as a hero and be fated and would have lots of ladies being very encouraging towards him. Sadly, he found none of that for him. In fact, he found that the Welsh ladies were singularly unimpressed by the bedraggled state of his soldiery. And actually, quite a few of them beat up his soldiery. I keep emphasising this at various points, because frankly, the, the, there are many, many things in this operation which are just bad. But for a, it would be a full carry-on film. It would be a full carry-on film. Anyway, at... 1700 hours. Whilst Tate's mixture of Irish, French, and American officers, and some of his Irish officers didn't speak English or French, so I'm not sure what they. Uh, so there's all sorts of communication fun going off. Um, and we're actually cancelling surrender because of Castanier having left as he was ordered to. Um. At that same time, the British forces reach Fishguard. And Cordor decided that he's going to try and attack it before dusk. He thought he'd try and do a surprise attack, because frankly, he was looking at the French and going, they're really not that organised. And he has, about this point, about 600 troops and free cannon. So he was marching up uh, Trefgree Lane from Goodwick. This is towards the French position, which was mostly centred on a little bit, uh, hamlet sort of area of Garngelly. And this is where, honestly, one of those interesting things doesn't happen. Because there is almost a chance for the French to redeem themselves in this battle. Because Lieutenant Sir Ledger had got some of his grenadiers in a great spot to ambush the troops as they were coming up. Using the high hedges of the lane, all those things, to do a proper ambush. Before it could happen, though, Cordor went, Frigate, it's getting dark. I don't like these hedges. I don't like this position. And as much as they may be surprised, honestly, my troops are tired. Am I attacking? And this is when you can you actually start to see the difference between a good and a bad commander. And this is one of the reasons why I'm saying Cordor's not much more experienced than Knox, but he does have enough of a sense to start making thinking things through. He's going... Yeah, there is an advantage to having a surprise attack, and they are going to realise I'm here, definitely by tomorrow. But it's dark, my troops aren't trained to work to uh, work with each other, and I don't want to run a night attack. It's too late, we're going back. He'd thought that the dusk was going to stay lighter than it was, and there is occasionally a bit of a twilight in the British, sort of, in the west of the, uh, of the British Isles, in sort of February, March, where you can think it's going to stay a bit lighter than it is for a little while. But it was obviously not going to, and so he returns to Fish Regard. And he returns to the Royal Oak, where he sets up his headquarters. It's a lovely pub, it's still open to this day. I highly recommend going and visiting it. It's really nice atmosphere, and 
if you are interested in this area of history, if you are interested in the last invasion of Britain, where the actual headquarters for the British forces involved in the battle, you can go and have lunch there. You can go and have dinner. You can go and have a pint. Unfortunately, I don't serve iron brew, but I do serve coke, so that did quite well. Not the same, but it did okay. That evening, though, um, two French officers arrive at the Royal Oak, and there's an interesting question as to whether they were actually sent by Tate or not sent by Tate. They wanted to negotiate a conditional surrender. I'm not sure on what grounds they felt they could get a conditional surrender. They'd invaded an island nation. So did they think the British would allow them to wait there until French ships turn up to take them away? Did they think the British would provide the ships to take them away themselves? I know they do that with Napoleon, but there's a bit difference between Napoleon in Egypt being given a sh uh, being taken back by Sir Sidney Smith to France to cause trouble, and allowing French troops to escape from the British Isles after they'd invaded. Cordor, in true Cordor fashion, bluffs. He claims he has a superior force, and he would only accept the unconditional surrender of the French. Remember, the forces are pretty much evenly matched at this point. Cordor has roughly 600 personnel. Tate has roughly 600 personnel. And he issues an ultimatum to Tate that he had till 10am on 24th of February to surrender on Goodwick Sands. Otherwise, the French would be attacked. Now, he does have some advantages. He has artillery. He has cavalry. Those are advantages. Those are advantages. But it's a fairly even force mix. Now, here is where some more interesting chicanery happens. Because the British forces line up in battle order on Goodwick Sands. On the cliffs above them, the women of the town of Fishguard marched out in traditional Welsh costume. This is a red whittle, a shawl, and a Welsh hat, which does look like from a distance a shako and red coats, which is what the soldier, a regular line infantry wore. And they march out being led by Jemima Nicholas, probably, um, who had already managed to um, capture some... French soldiers, single-handedly at least 12, and locked them inside St. Mary's Church. She'd also led other women in doing other things. And basically, with a NCO from the Woolwich Gunners, forms them up and marches up, and they, so they, they look like this other line of infantry. So it looks like you have regular infantry behind the militia forces. Which does look quite big. And of course they have artillery. And the gunners are all doing their war... Uh, firing their guns. And one of the things... The Royal Navy captain brought with him... Was the su supply of shot for the guns. So... The cannon now had ball. <laughs> and there's a lot of them sitting in Fishguard Fort. And they've got three more they brought with them. It's... There's artillery going on, there's cavalry, there's infantry, and you can see a lot of troops, and you think more are coming up from Haverford West. There are sounds, and uh, there are noises coming that there are more troops than there are, were more troops coming up from Haverford West, and so the French are sort of going, hang on, this doesn't look good. Now, Tate tries to delay things, because he didn't want to accept the unconditional surrender, but... At 2 p.m. And what's really good is that Cordor holds his nerve. And all these troops hold their nerve. They don't dissipate. They don't try and attack. They just hold themselves impassive and ready. The French drums were heard at about 1400 hours, 2 p.m. And their column came down to Goodwick. The remaining French soldiers that were actually obeying Tate's orders. 
and by 1600 hours they'd all piled up their weapons and the French prisoners were marched through Fishguard on their way to imprisonment at Halford West. Now, what a really bold move is Cordor rides himself with his Pembroke Yeomanry Cavalry, his own company, to Treyhole Farm to receive the official surrender from Tate. He rides out himself. Now, why is this a really clever move? Because whilst it's sort of also kind of traditional, and he doesn't really have anyone else he can send, it shows an extreme confidence in your position that you're prepared to come out and you're leading out your cavalry. And they also had some possibly some other things going on with other farm horses, etc., wandering around looking like they had more cavalry. They, the British do all sorts of interesting things, or rather, the Welsh do. The Welsh really go full, hmm, we can muck with you here. Uh, the Welsh have a long history of being very good at psychological warfare, and honestly, you feel sort of sorry for Colonel Tate at this point. Really sort of sorry for it. I'd also say I have a strong suspicion that it was the Woolwich Gunners and the Ladies of Fishguard who kept things organised and safe while Knox was mucking around until Cordor turned up. And then Cordor seems to be... There are discussions about that he worked with the people of Fishguard, and that's one reason why he set up his, his headquarters in the Royal Oak, because... It managed to, it gave him easy access to the people to work with them and find out all the information and sort things out and get a command team going. So he does a really good job, but he's building on, he's found the people on site who are doing a good job. And instead of trying to tell them what to do, he's trying to make that, get them to work together as a team. And that is, that is really good. That takes a lot of skill. I think he's helped in that role because again, we're dealing with, a quite a traditional society in Britain, and he is a lord. And we would all like to believe we have evolved beyond that, but I have been in events and scenarios, even today in the UK, and sometimes you've got lots of people giving different, different views, da 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 and then the person who, if they are a lord, and they are, I'm talking almost a traditional lord, they're there, and they just go, Let's think about this. And thanks to the title, it does help. They do sort of... They can calm things down if they are skilled with it. It's how... You, it's not just having the title doesn't give you the power or the influence. It's how you can use the title. It's to send an appeal for to authority, but like with all things which are appeals to authority, it only works if you can back up your words with a sense of authority. And that's what Cordor does. And the French surrender. So. This is an interesting battle. It's also an interesting example in. You have a full complex operation you are planning and you want to accomplish. Great. You also need to make that complex operation work. And you need to pull it off. And you don't need to have it going bitty. This operation gets very bitty. Honestly the only thing worse than the evasion of Fishguard to try and get to Bristol, and if you look it up on the map, you'll see that they would have had to march through several fortifications. There's almost there's garrison towns on the way. There's all sorts of militias. It, their only hope was if the entire population of the area rallied to them, and they weren't going to. And the reason I say they weren't going to is that the people they were bringing were the wrong people to bring. Wales had been attacked by Americans in the War of Independence. They'd been attacked by French. The The love-loss scenario in that, in, in that area was not much to begin with, and it was gone. And then you start going in and you attack their churches. And Wales at this point was... There are still quite a strong religious ethic a religious focus within the Welsh culture yeah that's that was not a good scenario in the British command structure frankly it's also terrible let's be honest the British do there are 
possibly three characters in the command structure for disturb and deserving of any praise. One of those is not really in the command structure. I'd like to point that out because Lord Milford is the Lord Lieutenant of the county, but he really shouldn't have been having to draw, to sort things out. The only reason he's having to sort things out is because the colonels are not doing their jobs. And he has to go and get the captain. Yes, he's another lord, but he's a captain of the Yeomanry Cavalry. It's, it's kind of reaching down in the bucket and going, Yes, I found a gem. Not a particularly bright gem, but a gem which is good enough at its job. But he's having to reach... And... The actual debate, which seemed to have been a time that, in his mind, was whether he could give command to Campbell or Longcroft, who is the other good officer. Colby is doing a fine job of organising, bringing things together at Halford West. He can't really be, he can't really leave there, and he's not sure about him doing this sort of operation. The other officers involved, and there were others, were also interesting. But you've got Knox, who, yes, you can go, well, he, he was outnumbered. He was, you know, he, he made right decisions. He didn't really. If he'd, probably if he'd held command of Fishguard and hadn't withdrawn, the odds are when Campbell, a Baron Cordor, Lord Cordor, turns up, Cordor has to turn over to him because he hasn't abandoned his command. He's the senior officer in command on the scene. He's held his position. You have now reinforced him. By abandoning his command, he makes it possible for court orders to take him to take over the post. That's it. By abandoning his command, he delegitimizes himself in as being in charge. And the French, well, what can I say? Penal units, if you are going to form them up, require an amazingly strict level of discipline. An amazingly level, a strict level of discipline. And as such, are not always the most innovative fighting machines. Because they have to put so much effort into discipline that the freedom which you give troops to encourage their creativity for adaptation in battle is not really as much of an option. It doesn't matter as much in this period as we'll do later. But the Legion Noir, it, it just collapses. You've risked these frigates. Many of them get captured. Uh, you've risked um, all these personnel. You've sent them all over there. And what have you gained? Nothing. Would it have been better if they concentrated those extra 3,000 troops with the forces heading to Ireland? I don't think so. Because they're attacking in winter! Who attacks the British Isles in winter? Just... There are times to do an amphibious operation around Britain. Winter is not them. There is a reason why not uh, why D-Day does not take place in December. And that's on the coast of France. You, you, you don't do that. Okay? It just it just doesn't make sense. So it's all the whole thing is They have this glorious idea that the people of Ireland will rebel and join up, and they've been promised that by the United Irishmen, and that doesn't work, and they've also got this idea the people of Wales will, and the people of Newcastle will, and they will get them all together, and they'll bring the people from Ireland across the, across the Irish Sea, and they'll land, and they'll join up their armies, and they'll march on London and knock Britain out of the war. And you sit there and go, you are basically relying on three very disparate groups, A, rebelling, and B, working together. There's a very big difference between getting a United Irishman to rebel in Ireland and getting them across the Irish Sea to invade invade England. There is very big differences there. And that's if you can get the United Irishman to actually rebel. Because there is a big step between a disquiet and bad sentiment and fear and, you know, the upset and the true trauma they were suffering, and all these things, and actually rebelling in a unified formation, because you first of all have to get a command structure and things working. That's a lot of the problem for a lot of organisations when you try, you want to organise a rebellion, when you want to change the status quo, 
it's actually getting some sort of command structure going so you can actually run these things. And there isn't one. I know. Thank you for watching. I always end these videos with a question, and the honest the question I want to ask is how could it have got any worse? And I think the answer to that is the new castle one. Uh, there have been a few discussions about what could have happened if they didn't, if they carried and managed to get the Newcastle tr troops to Newcastle, and so that's what I'm going to ask you all. I think, what do you think would have happened if they'd landed in with their aim to get to Newcastle? Um, they weren't quite sure where they were going to land to attack Newcastle, so there is every real option they could land as far away from Newcastle as they have landed away from Bristol in this scenario. They're supposed to be getting to Bristol. They landed at the far end of the Pembrokeshire coast. <laughs> it's a long way away. <sighs> oh, it's a long way away. Right, more coming up. This week we have the Age of the Seaplane Carrier. Basically World War One. World War One is the seaplane carrier. Now it's it's an interesting thing. There are, there are some interesting stuff coming up, and it's Ben Mashri and A two four Squadron, which I do love because. I spent a lot of time with 824 Squadron over the years. Way too much time. Thank you very much for watching. Hope you enjoyed. If you liked the video, please like. Please maybe consider sharing and subscribing. Those are all very good because, as I may have mentioned at the beginning, I have a small competition going between... Well, not I have. There's a small competition going between my aunt and my mum. And I'd like my mum to get a spa day. And I'd also like the competition to be over because it's been going on for years now. So I have to get the 15,000 subscribers. By 23.59 hours on the 24th of December, 2024. Please. Thank you very much for watching, and take care.